On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at Japanese armor, what it means to Japanese people, and how it reflects their sense of beauty. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Our theme for today is armor, and I've come to the Tokyo National Museum, which has in its collection some of Japan's most valuable suits of armor. The earliest Japanese armor was heavily influenced by the civilizations of China and Korea, but around the 12th century a distinct style of Japanese armor began to emerge, and this suit, which comes from the 14th century, is typical with its helmet to protect the head and the body armor too. The horn-like decorations that you see on the helmet are purely aesthetic. They're intended to make the wearer look more awe-inspiring, and they do a pretty good job too. The beauty and the intricate workmanship which you see here have led some people to regard Japanese suits of armor as works of art in their own right, and this one has actually been designated a national treasure. Let's start off today with a look at some of the various types of Japanese armor. For around 100 years from the late 15th century, Japan was torn apart by internal conflict. Warlords battled constantly for control of territory. It was during this period that Japanese armor underwent its most impressive evolution. Suits were made featuring diverse motifs inspired by animals, the natural world, and religion. In this age of chaos, the warlord I Naomasa is said to have won every battle he fought. This suit of armor has been passed down through the I family. The helmet is topped with giant horns. It made an imposing statement that the general was on the field of battle. The armor is notable for its all over red lacquering for shin guards, arm protectors, torso armor, and helmet. In the army of the E clan, not only the general wore red armor, so did all his troops. Red was intended to boost his warriors' fighting spirit and intimidate their opponents. The color earned Naomasa the nickname the Red Demon and inspired fear in adversaries. Many suits of armor incorporated animal motifs. This helmet is adorned with deer antlers. Since ancient times in Japan, the deer has been considered a messenger of the gods. Armor with a deer motif was intended to summon divine assistance in battle. Here's a helmet with ears of a hare. It expresses a wish to dart across the battlefield like a hare. What does this outlandish helmet represent? The furry bar on the crest represents a hairy caterpillar. Caterpillars can only move forwards, never backwards. So the helmet expresses a determination to keep advancing on the battlefield. Mythical creatures appear as well. This helmet represents a winged monster called a crow goblin. It was believed to swoop over the countryside. According to legend, these crow goblins were also masters of swordsmanship. Featuring this creature on a helmet reflected a desire to invoke its supernatural power to open a path to victory. Animals weren't the only motifs used on Japanese helmets. Look at this bizarre shape. What in the world does it represent? This is Ichinotani in Hyogo Prefecture. The helmet is said to represent a precipitous slope in this area. In the 12th century, the famous general Minamoto no Yoshitsune led a cavalry charge down Ichinotani's steep slope in a surprise attack on an enemy encampment, achieving a great victory. With just 70 men, he routed an army numbering thousands. This victory became the stuff of legend, and a later warlord chose to decorate his helmet with a model of the sheer slope. 
The helmet belonged to a warlord named Kuroda Nagamasa, a powerful figure in Kyushu in the early 17th century. It was not uncommon for a Chinese character to be chosen as a motif. This helmet is adorned with the character for love. It's said to have come from Aizen Myo, worshipped as a deity of war and many other things. His name features the character for love. Because of that, the helmet has become a popular prop in a surprising setting. Here a man is putting on a suit of armor and that famous love helmet. But he's not heading to war. A woman gorgeously dressed as a Japanese princess appears. It's a wedding reception and the groom is wearing armor. People call this an armored wedding. The helmet represents the couple's desire to be as tough as a samurai warlord in overcoming adversity on their path to eternal happiness. Unless you happen to get invited to one of those samurai-style weddings, there are not that many opportunities to see a full suit of armor in today's Japan, at least not the full-sized version. This shop specializes in traditional Japanese dolls and around this time of year these miniature sets of armor are what they have on display. And the reason for that is that there's a day in May when traditionally Japanese households that have sons put these kind of suits of armor up in their houses. It expresses a wish for their sons to grow up healthy and strong. You can see that they're only a fraction of the size of the real thing but if you look at them closely you'll see that the intricacy with which they're made is absolutely the same. Let's move on now and take a look at how real suits of armor are made. Horseback and used both hands to shoot arrows, which meant they couldn't carry shields. So these shoulder guards performed the function of a shield. The protective skirt covers the lower torso and waist. Each piece is made of many leather strips fastened together with cords. It's strong, lightweight, and easy to move about in. Each of these leather strips is about five centimeters long. As many as 3,500 of them may be used in a single suit of armor. Each strip is lacquered, then they're all laced together with cords, half overlapping neighboring strips. Then additional lacquer is applied and allowed to dry. This is repeated six times, both on the front and back. This adds waterproofing and strength.
The laced together strips are fastened with silk cords, forming the core components of the armour. The part for the upper torso has a covering of smooth deer hide to prevent the bowstring from catching on the armour when shooting arrows. The deer hide is stencil dyed with traditional auspicious motifs, such as mythical lions and peonies. It took Mura three years to make this suit of armour. He considers armoring to be a work of large-scale mixed-media art. It incorporates many different techniques, including metalworking, lacquering and leatherwork. Mura is one of the few armorers working in Japan today. Four years ago, he took on a new potential successor, American Andrew Mancabelli. Mancabelli came to Japan to study traditional culture. Believing that the best way to learn is to make things with his own hands, he became Mura's apprentice. I think that, for example, with Japanese armor, the pieces are small. Like, one helmet can be composed of up to 200 of these pieces. Um, generally, armors uh, in the West are uh, one piece construction. Technically, I think Japanese armor is probably one of the most highly skilled artworks in the world. The functionality of armor designed for combat and the aesthetic qualities of artwork. Because Japanese armor possesses both, it has fascinated many people through the ages and across borders. This is a residential area in Tokyo and surprisingly enough there's a shop here that specializes in Japanese armor. This is it. This is all replica armor which they both sell and rent out for movie shoots and festivals and all kinds of things. And I'm sure you can guess what's going to happen next. Well, this is your basic suit of armor. It's not quite complete yet. I've got on the leg guards. I've got on these sleeves, if you like, with bits of chain mail on them. You'll notice the rather, at a glance, unwarrior-like, but very beautiful anyway, uh, design of the socks and gloves here. And I've got a side piece. Uh, this stuff is all fairly constricting and reasonably heavy, but we've got come, uh, still haven't come to the main part. I, I can't wait. Um, Shall we do it? Okay. It's like you're wearing a suitcase that you take on your summer holiday. That's the kind of weight I've got on right here. And these warriors in the old days would be on a horse. And the reason they have these panels on the side um, as you saw earlier on, is that they're going to be holding a bow and arrow, probably. Uh, arrows. The short sword coming here. Oh, okay. Get that round my waist. Oh, what's this one for? This is to uh, protect the shoulder strap from getting cut. On this side, it's a hard plate which is meant to protect your heart. Ooh. And uh, now here comes the helmet. Well, this is the full set and my God, it's heavy. I don't know, I feel like if somebody just pushed me with one finger, I'd probably fall over and not be able to stand up anymore. And to think that these warriors hundreds of years ago had to walk around in this stuff, not only that, they had to be able to get up onto a horse, fire bows and arrows and wield a sword. I don't think I could even get this out of its scabbard probably, but let's just see if I can even walk. Just about, boy, this is heavy. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. 
Well, anything's worth a go, I suppose, but this is unbelievable. <laughs> okay, while I stand here trying to look casual, let's move on now and take a look at a special suit of armor that changed the course of Japanese history. Sekigahara in Gifu Prefecture. About 400 years ago, a battle was fought here that became a huge turning point for Japan. At the Battle of Sekigahara, the armies of Japan's Western and Eastern alliances clashed. It was among the largest gun battles that had ever been fought anywhere in the world. Firearms had come to Japan half a century earlier and spread widely. Several types of firearm were used in the battle. The victor was the leader of the Eastern forces, Tokugawa Ieyasu. He went on to become the first shogun of a new dynasty. And a certain suit of armor played a significant role in his triumph. Six months before the Battle of Sekigahara, a Dutch ship arrived at a small island in Oita Prefecture. Ieyasu quickly inspected its cargo and found that it included European armor. European armor was constructed in a completely different way from Japanese armor. When the two types are tested against a matchlock gun at the time, the difference is clear. First, traditional Japanese armor. Japanese armor designed for battles involving arrows, spears and swords offers no protection at all from bullets. What about Western armor? It was made of thick steel plate so bullets of the time could not penetrate it. It was also shaped to slope away from the center line to the left and right. This design helped to deflect bullets away from the wearer's torso. Ieyasu expected a fierce gun battle, so he adopted aspects of this European armor. He fused it with elements of traditional Japanese armor to create a new form. It was called Namban Armor, meaning Armor from the West. For the critical parts, the head and torso, the European armor was used unmodified. But Japanese armor was used to protect the shoulders and legs, since it offered more maneuverability. Japan is very mountainous, Soldiers have to be able to move swiftly up and down slopes to win in battle. Ieyasu's secret weapon was armor that combined the bulletproofing of European armor with Japanese armor's freedom of movement in rough terrain. Ieyasu used Namban armor not only in battle, but also for political purposes. He was at a sharp disadvantage in the number of men he could field, so he devised ways to win powerful warlords over to his side. One strategy was to present European-style helmets to the generals fighting on his side. On September the 15th, 1600, the decisive battle began. A total of 50,000 firearms were used at the Battle of Sekigahara. Ieyasu's men fought without fear of bullets and won the battle in just seven hours. In 1603, Ieyasu moved his capital east to the city of Edo, today's Tokyo. He had finally brought peace to Japan after generations of chaos. Hello, it's me again, in case you were wondering. 
This suit of armour is not exactly the same as the one that Ieyasu wore, but it's the same basic idea of using the Western design. With the first suit I was wearing, the breastplate was made up out of myriad very small pieces. This one has one big piece on the front, and then there's a similar piece on the back as well. It also feels quite a lot easier to move around in for various reasons. One of them is these pieces on the shoulder are much smaller, so you can move your arms around a lot more. And also this part around the waist here, around the hips, is, as you can see, just a lot easier to move around in. All right, let's move on again now. We're going to meet a man whose hobby is making traditional Japanese armor, but out of everyday modern materials. This is central Osaka, a procession of armored men. They seem to have stepped out of the past onto this modern shopping street. They're Japanese armor enthusiasts, whose hobby is to wear suits of traditional armor to local events and festivals. The leader of the group is Yoichi Katayama. He first became fascinated by Japanese armor 13 years ago, when a museum held an event that offered people an opportunity to try on a suit of Japanese armor. When I saw the costume and the armor, I thought, this is just so cool. To begin with, Katayama purchased replica armor, but that didn't satisfy his fascination for long. Six years later, he began making it himself. Katayama is now working on a new suit of armor. He heads to a hardware and craft supply store to buy materials. He fills his cart with everyday items. Paint, wire, laundry nets. Can he really make a suit of armor out of this stuff? The whole point of DIY armor is to use ordinary stuff to make something that looks like the real thing. Katayama's day job is running a bicycle shop. After closing up, he gets to work on his armor. In real armor, cowhide is used for the parts that protect the shoulders and legs. Katayama uses stiff cardboard instead. He cuts out a thousand strips and punches multiple holes in each one. He coats the strips in spray paint to obtain the same glossy finish as the costly lacquer of real Japanese armor. For the helmet, he substitutes thick paper for metal plates. And here's where Katayama's creativity really shines. He fashions studs from buttons that are meant to be used as the eyes of stuffed animals. The suit of armor he's working on is modeled on one belonging to Tyrano Tomomori, a warlord from the 12th century. There are details that you can't figure out just by looking at a photograph. So Katayama often goes to see the real suit of armor on display at a museum. After two and a half months working late into the night, a total of 300 hours, his masterpiece is complete. A real replica suit like this would cost millions of yen. Katayama made his for just 120,000. Five days after finishing the suit of armor, Katayama joins his fellow armor enthusiasts at a theme park that recreates the atmosphere of Japan a thousand years ago. He wanted to wear his armor in a setting reminiscent of Tomomori's day, and now the time has come for his dream to be fulfilled. Today, Katayama is showing off his newly finished suit of DIY armor to his companions for the first time. Even though the helmet's made of paper, it weighs about three kilograms. That's because of Katayama's attention to detail in decorating it. Now they will perform a dance in honor of historical warlords. The tourists who happen to be there can't believe their eyes. Hey! Hey! Oh! 
Every one of the performers looks like a warrior who has time warped from the 12th century. The craft of armoring was honed by the demands of ceaseless warfare, but the artistry it created continues to be appreciated even in a time of peace. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, as they say, although this is getting to about the limit. This helmet is so heavy. If I tilt my head over to one side even just a little bit, I think I'm going to fall over. This one's a candidate for the Ministry of Silly Hats if Monty Python ever get back together again. Anyway, after all these antics, I'm kind of starting to get a feel for how people get addicted to this stuff. I don't know if I, don't know if I quite go that far myself, but I'll see you again next time. Next time we look at sashimono woodwork, a traditional Japanese form of carpentry for making all kinds of furniture and other objects without the use of nails.